Uh, for those of you that were not here on Tuesday, I just wanted to review a few uh, introductory comments. Uh, this is Environmental Politics and Law. My name is John Wargo. I'm a professor of political science as well as environmental policy uh, in uh, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, the Department of Political Science, and uh, uh, I have an appointment in the college uh, for which I chair the Environmental Studies major. Uh, and this course is really designed to give you uh, an overview of environmental law, uh, some of its founding uh, and key principles, uh, but also to get you to think more broadly and deeply about uh, our capacity to use law to shape human behavior. Uh, and I think that the, uh, the cases that we'll go through will largely be uh, historical cases, but they'll be designed in a way and presented in a way to uh, encourage you to think about evaluating law, uh, to think about what's worked, uh, what has not, and why, as a way of thinking about uh, how you might design law for the future. And <clears throat> the cases that uh, we'll look at, I'm going to concentrate on today, and uh, these uh, are, are a variety that I've uh, had a, a chance to work on during my career. Uh, and the relationship between law and science uh, will be a really critical component of this course. Uh, there are no prerequisites for the course uh, so that you don't have to have training in, in uh, chemistry or biology to uh, do well in the course. Uh, but what you'll see is that scientific uncertainty, uh, especially, uh, is really important in how different groups exploit scientific uncertainty uh, they choose their own data selectively to tell their own narratives about what's worth worrying about. So this course is really designed to get you to think about what's worth worrying about in a, uh, in a deeper way uh, as a way to uh, encourage you to think about uh, your own behavior but also how you might uh, encourage others to, to behave uh, in a more responsible way. This is not a course in how to be an environmentalist, it's a course in, in how you might think about uh, uh, defining problems and, and solving problems uh, to uh, really help us think about uh, the world that we're creating, a world uh, uh, with uh, many billion more people in it uh, given our, our scarce resources. So today what I, what I wanted to do was just to briefly once again uh, in, in about 30 seconds uh, review uh, the obligations of the course which are to uh, show up. Uh, it's important to show up. Uh, all of the slides will be posted on the classes server uh, just after the lecture. And what I'm hoping you'll do is uh, come to the lecture because uh, you'll see often just images and you won't know how to inter interpret those images and, and uh, via my voice I'll be interpreting them for you. Uh, and also the discussion sections are critical to the course so that it's important that you go to your discussion sections uh, and I, uh, I think that all the times have been posted, is, is that correct Laura? All the times will be up on Friday so that you can make your choices. Uh, we have eight different sections that are set up and we're hoping that uh, uh, that's sufficient for the class. There is also the obligation uh, to <clears throat> either take a midterm paper or conduct a, uh, a, a research effort that would produce a paper, you know, roughly uh, 10 to uh, 12 pages in length. And I'll talk more about that. And, and as I lecture, I'll, I'll uh, often pause and suggest what I think are interesting research topics. Uh, that uh, will span a whole array of different kinds of, of laws and problems that we'll cover. <clears throat> so that uh, that will be followed at the end of the course by a uh, final examination uh, that uh, uh, also I'll, I'll provide a review session for. And I wanted to make uh, one thing clear about this. I made an obligation to uh, give a lecture at elsewhere uh, about a year ago uh, that uh, uh, is up at Dartmouth uh, next Thursday, so we will not have class next Thursday, but I will make that up by providing you with a lecture uh, at the end of the course, an additional lecture which will review all of the course material for you prior to the final exam. So let me start in. Uh, my interpretation of the, uh, the failures and successes of 20th century environmental law is very much tied to how problems have been defined. And if you look back in history, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, problems that have become immediately apparent have reached the press uh, and uh, a wide public have often been translated into law. So if you think about the uh, Cuyahoga River, which used to catch fire routinely in Ohio, uh, it used to catch fire because of the petroleum products that would lie in the surface of the water, uh, that prompted changes in the Clean Water Act to try to uh, uh, reduce the emissions uh, from industrial facilities uh, into the rivers. Uh, the uh, Toxic Substance Control Act 
uh, evolved after concern about a variety of, of uh, uh, events, uh, as well as the uh, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act that applies to hazardous waste sites, following the discovery that uh, a canal that had been uh, loaded up with toxic substances in New York State, known as Love Canal, had turned into a school site. Uh, the corporation had basically abandoned the facility, uh, and it was turned over to the community, which built a school. And uh, gradually, this uh, seeping, oozing, uh, uh, toxic soup uh, started bubbling to the surface of the playground and people's backyards and, and into their basements. Uh, and that prompted uh, the, the passage of, of the Superfund law uh, back in the 1980s. So in, in many respects, uh, law follows public recognition of significant threat that uh, is a surprise in a sense. But these laws evolved not in a systematic way. It was not as if somebody said, OK, we need, uh, uh, we need air law. We need uh, uh, clean water law. Uh, we need uh, toxic substance control law. We have to worry about hazardous sites. And what about all the federal land management responsibilities? How are we going to manage uh, grazing lands, timber lands, uh, access to minerals? Uh, how about private development? Uh, how are we going to manage new development, new subdivisions? Uh, it, rather than there being some sort of a comprehensive vision uh, about uh, uh, the nature of law that was specific, saying, OK, this kind of problem should be dealt with best at the federal level, as opposed to another kind of problem should be dealt with by states, and what about local governments? Uh, which, which level of government has the best capacity to, to deal with which kind of problem? No one sat down and thought comprehensively about this. And the result is really what I think of as a, uh, a really uh, a fragmented patchwork quilt that's quite frayed of uh, various statutes that are pieced together uh, that uh, have embedded within them different decision standards uh, as well as uh, different levels of, of funding uh, and administered by a variety of different agencies. So when I talk about environmental law, uh, you, you probably know that the Environmental Protection Agency has a primary responsibility to administer some of the core statutes, like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. But there are many other statutes that deal with uh, chemicals in the environment uh, that uh, give authority to groups like the Food and Drug Administration, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, as, as examples. Uh, and, and often responsibility for one kind of a problem, uh, and we'll, we'll see this particularly with respect to pesticides, is, is fractured among different agencies with responsibility to implement. So the Department of Agriculture has a responsibility to, to uh, consider the benefits and cost of farmers of new pesticide regulations. EPA has the responsibility to look at toxicity data for pesticides and to judge what the risk is and to set the standards. The Food and Drug Administration has the responsibility to go out and monitor what's in the food supply so we know whether or not people are being exposed to dangerous stuff, uh, chemical residues. So uh, does this make sense? That absolutely d does not. And then when we get to the pesticide case, I'll, I'll tell you uh, a story about uh, how I tried to pull data together from uh, the Department of Agriculture uh, on what people eat, uh, pull data together on, uh, from the Food and Drug Administration about what residues they found in those foods, pull data from the Environmental Protection Agency together in a way that, that uh, made sense to try to figure out what you or an individual might be exposed to and what your risk might be. Uh, the databases were all set up in different formats, uh, using different software. It was a, a nightmare, and it took about three years to integrate the data sets in order to answer the simple question, what are people exposed to? So the uh, patchwork quilt that's frayed, uh, that offers insufficient protection, is a, is a key image that I want you to carry with you. How we define problems uh, often uh, will re result in, in uh, uh, the effectiveness of, of, of the solution. And often the problems have been uh, highly reductionist uh, in their definition. And <clears throat> this has uh, uh, also been associated with their assignment to specific agencies. And we'll see that uh, many of these problems cross uh, many different boundaries. And uh, the absence of thinking in a systems way or thinking ecologically lies at, at uh, uh, the core of the issue. So what are the central questions of environmental law? Uh, one is the level of government that's appropriate to the problem. Clearly, if you have air pollution blowing across state boundaries and local boundaries, uh, if everybody sets their own, every state sets their own uh, air pollution law, uh, that's going to be a nightmare. Everybody has their own, if each state has their own standard. Uh, another key question would be what branch of government uh, should establish the law? Uh, so should it be the uh, uh, Congress or should it be the executive branch? Uh, so EPA has the authority to set regulations. So Congress passes a statute, 
sets out broad guidelines, and then the Environmental Protection Agency has the authority to set regulations that uh, really are more refined and dependent upon uh, scientific evidence. So you really wouldn't want Congress uh, to get involved in the setting of highly specific regulations uh, that uh, uh, really would uh, uh, demand an understanding of the technical details. What's our capacity to detect this chemical? Uh, what's our capacity to uh, uh, understand its risk? Who's most at, at threat? What are the costs and benefits associated with the regulation? Do we really want Congress to deal with that kind of specificity? And I think often not. Therefore, the executive branch, uh, meaning the uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency or other regulatory agencies, are often given that authority. When they're given that authority uh, and they don't do anything about it, ha as has been the case uh, for many of these problems, uh, Congress often will call them up and uh, hold hearings and, and demand uh, them to explain why nothing has been accomplished. And we'll talk about the Safe Drinking Water Act as a great example of that, where Congress finally threw up its hands and said, uh, EPA, you're just not doing your job, and uh, we are going to specify which chemicals you have got to test for in drinking water, and uh, you have got to set maximum contaminant levels for those chemicals in drinking water, and you've got to do it by date X. Uh, they did that also with the, the hazardous chemicals uh, law, so that uh, Congress does get uh, uh, upset. Regulations can be passed by the president uh, via executive order. And also the judiciary plays a really critical role, so that the, the uh, collection of decisions surrounding any one of these problems creates precedent uh, for future decisions. Uh, and courts are often in a position of interpreting uncertainty in the language of statutes, uh, but also uncertainty in the, in the language of regulations. And they're highly individualized cases. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the uh, uh, process of, of adjudication in, in the court system is not uh, very close to the process of discovering new knowledge that uh, we think about here within the academy. Uh, it, it's not about discovering truth. It's not about proving causality. Uh, it's about control of evidence to tell a story. So uh, the courts really are, are uh, uh, looking at competing narratives of uh, what the problem is, what the damage is, and whether or not the uh, d defendant uh, really is responsible for adversely affecting the plaintiffs. So another key question is monitoring and surveillance. And it's very easy to pass a law that sounds great on, on, uh, uh, on its face. Uh, but if you look at it really carefully, what you'll find is that there's really no comprehension of how much monitoring and surveillance is required in order to really uh, do the job, to get the job done. So monitoring and surveillance, I think of as one of the primary defects of 20th century law. Uh, so we have grossly misunderstood the amount of, of uh, money that it will take to really figure out what happens when you release a chemical to the environment. What happens if you blow it out, out of your... Uh, uh, tailpipe on your car, or it comes out of a, uh, uh, a, a nuclear power plant, a radionuclide goes up into the air. What happens to that? To figure that out is extremely expensive. And uh, in society, with respect to air pollution law, chemical law, even endangered species management, understanding how many individuals of uh, both sexes of, uh, uh, of endangered mammals exist, where they are, what their reproductive rate is, that takes intensive monitoring. So when these laws are passed, if the, the uh, government does not set up a really effective and efficient monitoring and surveillance program, the whole thing is just like a waste of time. So uh, the, the uh, 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 level of, of misunderstanding of this issue, I, I just cannot, uh, I cannot emphasize enough. Uh, another key question is access to data. So who should have access to data? And I'll give you a good example of this. I'm working on a, a project now. And I'm working, uh, it happens to do with green building standards. And I was wondering about uh, carpet treatments. And uh, the uh, uh, Stain Master carpets, as an example, everybody's heard of Stain Master. Other, other chemicals are applied to the surface of carpets uh, to keep them from absorbing stains uh, or to keep things from sticking to them. Uh, so uh, you, you might think about uh, cookware as another example. Uh, a lot of cookware now, you don't have to put any sort of a, an oil into it in order to keep things from sticking in it. So the, the, the chemicals that uh, are used to accomplish this, including to make your, your clothing waterproof, uh, for example, uh, uh, I was skiing last week and I looked down at myself and I said, boy, you know, I thought this was just uh, you know, a nice waterproof uh, uh, shell that I was wearing. And then I started thinking, oh, you idiot. You know, you, you're, you're uh, uh, wearing a product and you have no idea what the ingredient is. And I'm reading a report saying, 
that everybody, uh, almost everybody, has this chemical in their, in their body and it's detectable in their human tissue. I mean, it's all of a sudden, the chemi- now think about this history. The chemical is released into the marketplace. It get u- <coughs> gets used in nonstick pans. It gets used <coughs> to be sprayed on the carpets to keep uh, you know, red wine from absorbing to the, to the fiber. It gets <coughs> sprayed on surfaces such as clothing to keep people dry uh, so that the functionality uh, has been the primary concern. Nobody asks the question, what happens to this chemical? Then down the road, somebody says, well, let's test, uh, let's test blood, or let's test urine, or let's test uh, body fat, or maybe even hair to, to figure out uh, where this thing is, is uh, going, or whether or not it's there. And uh, they find, lo and behold, that it is there. And then uh, to try to get the chemical out of the marketplace, which is now global, uh, is a very difficult thing to accomplish. So uh, access to data. Uh, I'm reading this report about this data, and the, uh, one of the major corporations, uh, DuPont, uh, is, is, has been producing chemicals that uh, have this, this effect. And uh, they submitted a report to EPA. EPA put it up online, and I, I, I've got to show it to you. Uh, I, I haven't gotten it up in a PDF format yet, but I've got to show it to you because every, every page has the, the title of the topic, uh, and then it has CBI written on it with nothing else. CBI is, is uh, uh, the acronym for Confidential Business Information. So the information was submitted to, from DuPont to the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Environmental Prote- Protection Agency basically shuts down the public from understanding what that is. Uh, and it's, it's all about how much of the chemical is produced, what the, the company knows about where it goes, uh, and also what the health effects or environmental effects might be. So access to data, intellectual property rights, uh, secrecy and confidentiality, these are all things that we really need to think about very carefully uh, when we structure environmental law. Another key question, number five, is should we allow preemption? Preemption is a a really interesting idea that uh, uh, the federal government could prevent a state from adopting regulations uh, that uh, might be different or less restrictive than the federal standards. And the, the Clean Air Act is a great example of this because the Clean Air Act uh, does preempt states from adopting uh, regulations that are different from the federal standards with respect to vehicle emissions, power plant emissions, uh, mercury emissions. And the state of California, however, was exempted by Congress when that statute was passed. And why is that? Well, it's because they have some pretty severe air quality problems. There are different patches in the country where air quality is very, very poor. Uh, and one is the LA Basin. Another is the uh, Salt Lake Basin, uh, and uh, Houston, Atlanta, Chicago, uh, New York, this area is out of compliance with Clean Air Act standards uh, quite routinely. Uh, And you might think that uh, this geographic and and, uh, climatological variability is a pretty good justification for states to have the capacity, the legal capacity, to set their own laws. Uh, So the states have far higher pollution than uh, uh, the national average. So that uh, thinking about uh, what kinds of problems uh, are amenable to uh, having states have more authority as opposed to when do we want to uh, centralize authority across uh, all states and, and, and loca- locate the authority with the federal government, this is a really important question. Another key question is administrative discretion versus statutory criteria. Uh, so when should Congress give the Environmental Protection Agency the administrative discretion uh, to set standards? Uh, to judge whether or not the economic benefits are, are outweighing what the environmental harm might be. Uh, should they have the authority to do that? So if you, if you adopt a utilitarian standard that's cost-benefit balancing or, say, risk-benefit balancing, uh, then you're basically giving the agency a lot of discretion to do their technical analysis and to try to figure out how to go through that balancing act. That gives them a lot of authority. Uh, as opposed to setting statutory criteria saying the risk shall not be greater than X. Say cancer risk should not be greater than one in a million. Or the uh, decision standard within the, the uh, Food Quality Protection Act uh, that the agency must uh, uh, find uh, a reasonable certainty that no harm will result from any pesticide. <laughs> Sounds unfortunate. So th- thinking about uh, whether or not it makes sense to, to uh, give an administrative agency that kind of discretion uh, is very important. And it depends, again, on the technical nature of the problem. Another key question is risk averaging. Uh, if you have lousy data, uh, data that uh, 
uh, is collected uh, maybe with very small sample sizes uh, so that you have no understanding of demographic uh, variability and exposure uh, or in the, uh, the, the, the complex uh, temporal and, and spatial distributional patterns of pollution, uh, then it's like looking at the world without my glasses on, which is, uh, uh, you know, all, uh, all the students look the same uh, so that uh, you lose any resolution, uh, you lose the ability to identify pockets of uh, uh, serious problems or high risk or high exposure. Uh, and if you don't have that resolution in your data, you can't go in and protect the most vulnerable, those people that are, are, uh, are most at risk. So uh, if, if uh, EPA uh, does not have uh, good monitoring and surveillance data, uh, they get to a, a position statistically where they're forced to, to average very broadly uh, across space, across time, and across demographic groups. And, and this is a very serious problem. Getting, uh, getting our system of environmental law to have the, the scientific and evidentiary foundation that allows the, the analyst to discriminate between uh, you know, what's a really clean area and what's a really dirty area. Uh, and I'll give you one example of that we'll, that we'll look at uh, later in the term with respect to vehicle emissions. Uh, I wondered about this because EPA sets their air quality monitoring out in fields. There's one just across the Q Bridge on Interstate 95, right next to the highway. When you go across, you get to the other side of the bridge. Uh, if you're heading east on 95, you can see it set up on a little platform. Uh, so that's a fixed monitoring site where they're measuring particulate matter, they're measuring ozone. Uh, occasionally, very occasionally, they measure VOCs. Uh, so that, that uh, uh, their image of the distribution of air pollution in the nation comes from this network of fixed stations. And they've got probably two dozen set up in Connecticut. Well, I wondered uh, whether or not uh, you would come to a very different conclusion about the quality of air and the movement of pollution, uh, particularly vehicle emissions and the carbon particles I was talking about on Tuesday, if instead of uh, uh, reading your data coming from the stations, uh, you put the monitors on kids and you follow them through their daily life. And the answer is, of course it's different. It's radically different. Uh, and I'll demonstrate uh, in a few weeks why that is. So uh, EPA has this image of, of uh, pollution being quite uniform across the state uh, or across a region, uh, whereas the pollution that you inhale uh, on a daily basis coming from secondhand cigarette smoke or firsthand cigarette smoke, uh, coming from uh, uh, vehicle emissions, coming from power plant emissions, power plants in Ohio, uh, generally it takes, it takes about uh, two weeks for particles released uh, to the air in Europe, if they're very fine, to make it into the stratosphere and to go all the way around the world and then uh, come back and, and become part of our climate. Uh, so that uh, it's very interesting that, that uh, uh, your image of, of uh, what's worth worrying about is very dependent upon this monitoring and sampling and, and how specific it is. Number eight is really critical, the burden of proof and the standard of proof. Who should bear the burden of proof that that uh, a problem is really serious. Well, industry often claims that it's the public's responsibility to demonstrate that their emissions, uh, their chemicals, their harvesting of a national forest, uh, that uh, that is creating a problem. So if this burden uh, lies on a, uh, an impoverished community uh, or it lies on a group of, uh, uh, of families in a small neighborhood, they're not gonna be able to mount the scientific analysis and. and and uh, develop the, the funding uh, to mount a legal campaign uh, to, to challenge industry standards. Uh, most large corporations have, have uh, groups of, of lawyers. They have uh, large uh, uh, offices of lawyers or they hire law firms to, to represent them. I've been involved in litigation for the past two decades uh, and have sat across the table from uh, six lawyers from a major chemical company uh, being deposed on a number of occasions. Uh, and this was just a very small group uh, of lawyers that, that were trying to pick apart, you know, my claim uh, that uh, a chemical posed a, sp a specific threat to, to children. Uh, so most uh, uh, plaintiffs would not have the capacity to mount that kind of legal expertise. And don't forget this basic, uh, this basic idea that probably 90%, even 95% even of, of environmental science of uh, health science relative to environmental quality, uh, what sector does that go on in? It doesn't go on in the public sector. It goes on in the private sector. 
uh, so that uh, corporations that are, are uh, very interested in, in making a profit uh, and selling uh, goods and services, uh, they basically are doing their own internal risk assessments uh, for what the effect might be on, on uh, the environment or human health. Uh, and those can never see the light of day. Uh, I'll talk in the pesticide case in a few weeks about uh, one compound. It's an organophosphate insecticide, one of the world's most heavily used. And uh, <clears throat> uh, via litigation, uh, the group I work with uh, uh, forced disclosure of, of a database that uh, uh, was really quite remarkable. Uh, this company had spent $100 million uh, on studies for one chemical to keep it in the marketplace so they could understand what its risks might be. Uh, now, that, that's quite impressive. Uh, so think about challenging uh, the quality of that evidence. Another company submitted a, a, uh, a proposal to the Environmental Protection Agency to continue their license to use a, a pesticide. Uh, this happened to be an herbicide known as atrazine. Atrazine is found in the wells of about 30 million people in the Midwest right now uh, because it's sprayed across the landscape planted with corn and, and, and soybeans. Uh, it's uh, uh, an endocrine disruptor. In other words, it's hormonally active. Uh, and also, uh, it, it's believed to, to pose different kinds of threats to human health. So <laughs> when, uh, when this corporation decided that it wanted to submit its data to the Environmental Protection Agency, they decided to do it uh, not electronically, but to deliver the material. And to deliver the material, it took them two tractor trailer loads uh, uh, of boxes with the data sets and the supporting evidence, which they drove up to the, the docks of the Environmental Protection Agency and, and unloaded. So imagine this uh, regulatory office of EPA looking at this uh, huge sea of boxes that they would have to analyze. That's a very interesting uh, strategy. So what would that do? Well, it basically would uh, put a regulatory effort that might be chugging down the road at a good pace, and it would put it in the deep freeze. It would slow it down to the point where, oh my gosh, this agency has to look at a thousand chemicals. This is one chemical, and we've got to go through all those data sets, and we're going to have to understand whether or not that evidence really is supportable, credible, replicable. Oh, that's going to slow things down. One out of a thousand chemicals. So uh, the burden of proof, the standard of proof, is a really critical issue. So for civil actions, uh, you, you need to remember uh, that uh, the, the plaintiff uh, needs to demonstrate that uh, damage occurred uh, not beyond a reasonable doubt, but by the standard of preponderance of the evidence. In other words, it's more likely than not uh, that the defendant caused the damage. Think about that with respect to the standard of proof required if you wanted to submit a paper to Science Magazine. Well, you know, you'd be asked questions about, uh, okay, what's your confidence interval? Uh, do you have 95% uh, confidence uh, in, in the uh, causal relationship that you're, you're uh, uh, hypothesizing? Uh, or is it 99% uh, confidence? Uh, so that the standard of proof that, that is applied uh, before a decision is made is a critical issue, and this can be adjusted if you're designing law. Uh, also, national sovereignty to re regulate uh, foreign hazards. Uh, there are a variety of international standards set up to uh, prevent the, the uh, export of, of hazardous waste. Uh, so the, there's quite a controversy brewing right now about electronic waste uh, being transmitted, particularly to uh, Asian nations, which are, are trying to uh, uh, recycle the, the precious metals out of, out of computer equipment, uh, old cell phones. Uh, and uh, even though there may be uh, only uh, 75 uh, cents per, per uh, uh, cell phone in terms of the value of, of those metals, uh, there are some uh, uh, three dozen different metals that can be extracted from electronic equipment. And uh, if they're thrown away or if they're burned, the material will go up into the atmosphere or it will make its way down into the soil and the groundwater. Uh, and also the people that are doing this, the people that are burning the plastic off of the electronic components in, in the metals, uh, they are often exposed at, at a high level. Uh, so that's a very interesting problem. How could we regulate international trade? Well, this issue of national sovereignty is very important. Does one nation want another nation telling it what it can and cannot import? Uh, does it want to uh, 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 demand that that nation adopt some sort of a un universal standard? And, and the answer is, is clearly no. Uh, and finally, uh, what criteria would we use to choose among the possible legal strategies uh, that uh, are, are there? So I'm going to uh, uh, skip uh, really quickly now uh, to a variety of different cases. 
And uh, I'd like you to imagine a society with no environmental law. And by the way, that was the United States back in 1950 uh, when we had no Clean Air Act, no Clean Water Act. Uh, and how would you design law in order to assure a healthy, productive, and sustainable future? That is a central question uh, that I hope uh, you can address by the end of the course. Now, imagine a society uh, in the year 2010, as we sit here, where our law is fractured by problem and by media. Uh, so by media, I mean air, water, food, or, or by problem type, hazardous wastes or hazardous sites or, or uh, uh, pesticide problem. It's fractured by level of government. Uh, there's very little surveillance. It tends to evolve at a snail's pace, and a little anecdote there, uh, in, in a variety of uh, decisions to uh, regulate or license an individual chemical or a new product, uh, it often will take EPA uh, up to a decade or 15 years to go through a review to determine whether or not uh, that chemical uh, is safe, whether or not uh, it poses excessive risk, uh, or what the uh, economic benefit is if it's, a, if it's being reviewed under a balancing and, and cost standard. Uh, so that, uh, uh, now imagine this, out of the 80,000 chemicals that are out there in international commerce, if it takes EPA 15 years to review one chemical, what does that tell you about what their capacity is to manage your exposure to dangerous things? It tells you it's exceptionally limited. Our system of law also provides a false sense of security because most of us believe uh, that uh, the, the, uh, uh, the little statements on the back of uh, uh, different products such as uh, uh, an herbicide in the hardware store that says this is EPA's license, that's almost a certification of safety in most people's minds. Many people think it wouldn't be in the marketplace if it was dangerous. People have, have reviewed this, right? Well, uh, you know, by the time you're finished with this course, uh, you, will, you will be thinking uh, uh, quite, a, quite a lot about that problem. So environmental law is also highly specialized in the sciences. And as I just said, about 95% of environmental science goes on in the private sector. Uh, and what that means is that uh, they have a, a, a leg up, they have a competitive advantage in controlling the narrative about uh, the nature of the danger. So that uh, thinking about uh, how to uh, set up an institution uh, that uh, really would produce science that would be publicly available, that would be uh, uh, transparent, it would uh, be open, uh, the data would be out there so you or I could uh, review it, I mean that's a, that's a big obligation. Uh, it's also highly politicized in its implementation. Uh, there are all sorts of stories about uh, regulators in, inside the Food and Drug Administration, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the Environmental Protection Agency, and how they move uh, at fairly high levels from the agency, ass Assistant Administrator for Toxic Substances in EPA, <laughs> going to work for Monsanto. Uh, they'll go to work for Monsanto uh, during uh, periods of, of uh, uh, liberal administration, and then they'll come back into the administration uh, during periods of conservative administrations. So that uh, there's this revolving door idea among top regulators that's extremely difficult to regulate. Uh, also, uh, <clears throat> our system of law is very poorly supported by the nonprofit community. You may think that there's a large network of, of nonprofits out there that are, are uh, playing the watchdog role, uh, but, but you're wrong. In fact, uh, in the area of the Safe Drinking Water Act, there is no nonprofit in Washington, D.C. that has taken the Safe Drinking Water Act under its, under its purview, saying this is our specialty. But you can always count on them to be there to, uh, to uh, uh, try to uh, judge the, the reasonableness of, of a proposed regulation. Uh, generally, uh, in the system of environmental law that we've got, uh, is, is utilitarian. It, it, it's, it's balancing of, of costs and, and uh, benefits uh, or risks or, or uh, the estimate of damages and, and uh, what the economic benefits might be. And inherent in that decision standard is this problem. You've got costs that are pretty easy to quantify. And if you've got a firm that's making a product, uh, they're going to tell you with pretty good accuracy their opinion about uh, what what they would lose if you took that right away from them to produce that product. Uh, now, by contrast, if you think about uh, uh, <coughs> the damage side of the equation or the risk side of the equation, that's a projection, that's a projection out into the future. Uh, that's a probabilistic estimate of what might happen into the future. 
and the global warming uh, 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 transformation in thinking that we've we've uh, we've seen over the past decade has really been quite remarkable because people are thinking now uh, out over a long time horizon in ways that they never had before. You know, what is the climate going to be like, and what's it going to do to our ecosystems and to our our, our shorelines and to our health a hundred years down the road? There are very few people that uh, think out in that long term. Uh, so how do, you, how do you project damages out over long periods of time? Well, you rely on very complex computer models to do that. Uh, so that you have to have faith in, in, in those who are doing the projection and the quality of the analysis. So that uh, uh, this problem can be kind of capsulized in the idea that costs are often relatively well known uh, and they can be projected with relative precision over the short term compared to uh, the harms, the environmental and health harms, uh, that are highly uncertain and they're often projected way out into the future with a really fuzzy image of how they're going to fall out differently on, on different groups. Uh, also our system of law, uh, environmental law, has been trivialized, I think, uh, by uh, the concerns that we have over international security and, and terrorism. Uh, basically nobody was talking about uh, environmental law for several years. Uh, between 2001, uh, following the, uh, the attack on the trade centers, uh, and 2004, 2005, uh, environmental law came back to life. But even when the public is, is asked, you know, what do you care about most in terms of problems that the United States faces, you will see issues such as the economy uh, regularly being first on that list. Uh, you'll see issues of national security being in the top two or three. Uh, but people are thinking in a, in a much uh, about a, a very different collection of problems rather than, than environmental concern. We'll be talking about the importance of a public perception of the environment compared to these other social objectives in the future. Uh, one other point I wanted to make is that the, the estimates today uh, are that uh, the system that we have in place now uh, costs industry about uh, 300 to 400 billion dollars per year in the United States alone uh, only in compliance costs. That's pretty remarkable. Uh, EPA and, and other groups have reviewed this estimate uh, along with the Government Accountability Office. Uh, that's, a, that's a very large investment. So put the pieces together here of what I've just told you. I've told you that we have this system of law that is not working very well uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Now I'm telling you that this is costing society an enormous amount of money. Well, uh, does that make sense? We'll, we'll come back to that issue uh, during the term. Now I'm going to spend about 10 minutes uh, just quickly reviewing some of the cases that we'll go through that will demonstrate some of these, these key principles. 1955 was a, uh, a, 1954 was a turning point uh, for environmentalism uh, in the nation and in the, in the world because uh, it, it basically taught people to think at a global scale about nature and about the environment for the very first time. And it's the result of this explosion on the Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands that punched up radioactive material into the stratosphere and at the time they thought that well we had to worry about where it would, uh, where it would go, how it would be distributed uh, within a couple hundred miles and a variety of mistakes were made uh, in, including uh, uh, exposing people working for the military. Uh, this group of people was uh, uh, sitting in, in these lawn chairs in their shorts and uh, uh, their caps on, they had ski goggles on, you know, with the dark lenses, thinking, well, that would be safe enough. Uh, there are many, many stories about workers being exposed uh, beyond what normal, uh, normally we would think of as, as being a safe level today. So what you don't know uh, can hurt you. And the more you ask about uh, chemical movement, the, the more we recognize that uh, chemicals actually persist longer than we thought they would. Uh, they often move further in, in uh, ways that were non-intuitive. Uh, through ecosystems, marine food chains. Uh, they they uh, may get deposited in the landscape in different ways. We'll see next week when we take this story apart uh, that uh, one of the major surprises was that this material got into global circulation uh, so that everybody in the world was exposed to radionuclides, strontium-90, iodine-131, cesium-137. Uh, and your parents were all, are all walking around today with those byproducts that often have half-lives of thousands of years. So that uh, these, are, these are really important lessons. The Atomic Energy Commission figured this out by 1955, 1956. They figured out that uh, these, these radionuclides uh, wouldn't just uh, kind of go away, and that's been, uh, that's been the perception of, of uh, uh, most people about chemicals released to the environment. They just go away. 
uh, well, many of them don't go away, uh, particularly radionuclides. And uh, they move around the world. Uh, they <laughs> tend to settle down. The, the heavier particles will settle down uh, when it's dry. The finer particles tend to aggregate. And then when a rain cloud intersects with, with the dust cloud, uh, as they settle down into lower elements of the atmosphere, that's when they rain down into the Earth. And that creates a patchy pattern of contamination. It's a patchy pattern, but we can figure out uh, what the deposition, deposition rates were 50 years ago today just by taking soil samples. It's very interesting. <coughs> so that uh, you can back calculate the half-life of cesium-137 or strontium-90. <coughs> and you see that it, it actually plays out, <coughs> excuse me, in a very patchy way. <clears throat> that is dependent upon this intersection between the dust cloud and the rain clouds. So the number one failure that we'll see uh, as we go through this case is a failure of systems thinking, a failure to think ecologically. But the Atomic Energy Commission was clearly thinking ecologically back in 1955. Uh, but then we, we've been waking up over the past uh, 50, 60 years uh, uh, without really paying much attention to this story. So that uh, we'll see as uh, 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 the milk was tested uh, and the ground soil contamination levels of strontium-90 were tested between the period of 54 and, and 1958 when uh, more atomic uh, bombs were exploded than in, during any other period in human history. Uh, you see this, this uh, correlation, this rise in, in uh, levels in the soil and levels in the milk. And then you see the uh, levels in the human diet going up during the same period of time and the levels in human bone. They didn't know that. They didn't know that at the time they designed the bombs. Uh, so that uh, they didn't know that strontium-90 would compete with calcium uh, to, to uh, uh, be fixed within bone in, in the human body. Uh, but the, the uh, Atomic Energy Commission uh, created this clandestine operation where they collected dead bodies from 15,000 people around the world. Uh, and they sent them to labs in Chicago uh, and to, uh, to uh, Lamont uh, Laboratory and uh, to Columbia University where they were tested. Uh, and every bone they tested found strontium-90 in it and it really woke them up. Uh, you can find this story uh, only because this documentation that was formally classified for the, uh, until the uh, mid to late 1990s uh, is now available in the declassified documents database. It's really a fascinating story. So these people were sitting around in the Atomic Energy Commission's headquarters actually saying, well, you know, what is the law on body snatching? They use that phrase, body snatching. Where are we going to get cadavers? Uh, do we really have to ask relatives about this? Well, what about homeless people? Uh, so the Atomic Energy Commission was uh, uh, collecting bones from around the world, and they were able to, to build this map of the deposition rate of strontium-90 uh, by looking at uh, bones that came from Argentina, bones that came from South Africa. I can just imagine what their faces looked like when they saw the levels uh, uh, <coughs> that uh, were spanning all latitudes and basically uh, all nations in, in the world. Well, this story gets repeated. It gets repeated chemical by chemical uh, as EPA begins to come to life in the 1970s and 80s, begins to wake up, in this case, to polybromated uh, diphenyl ethers uh, that uh, uh, are these uh, flame retardants uh, that uh, we now all walk around with. And it's a, a common story that we, we first find the chemicals in wildlife. Why? Because they're easy to test. Um, people generally don't like to give bone samples so that uh, uh, their, their bones can be tested for strontium-90. Uh, by the way, there's an interesting uh, uh, kind of way to, to figure out what's in your bone uh, by testing teeth. Uh, so by testing the deciduous teeth of, of young kids, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission figured this out, and they were actually going around from dentist to dentist collecting teeth from people, uh, thinking, well, you know, why were we crazy enough to have to collect bones from dead people when we could have just collected teeth? So, so you, find, uh, you find this pattern of recognition first in wildlife, then they say, oh, well, you know, how, how did it get into the wildlife? Uh, and then gradually somebody said, boy, if it's in the wildlife, it might be in humans too. Uh, and gradually people started testing breast milk. Breast milk became the, uh, the tissue of choice in order to, to uh, uh, understand whether or not chemicals were being transmitted transgenerationally. And uh, it also is it's easy to collect. Uh, it uh, is relatively inexpensive to store. And here's a good example of DDT found in different nations around the world in breast milk in the 1970s. So human tissue testing became really an important way to figure out 
uh, what people were, were exposed to. And if you know that you find it in somebody's body, then you have this kind of interesting problem. Well, how do I figure out where I encountered it? How, how was I exposed? Did I breathe it? Did I eat it in the food? Did it come in the drinking water? So these are all questions that EPA has faced on numerous occasions. Uh, this is the island of Vieques that we'll spend uh, a lecture on or two in a few weeks where I've worked for a couple of years. And I've worked on hazardous uh, uh, defense sites and, and the process of their restoration for, for uh, uh, sites in, in Massachusetts, uh, sites in California, as well as sites in, in uh, Puerto Rico. And this is a fascinating story uh, that uh, uh, led me to understand how chemicals move through the food chain. And uh, this is a bombing run. 200 million pounds of bombs were dropped on this little island uh, over the period between 1940 uh, and 19, 19 uh, uh, or actually 2003. So I wondered, where did the chemicals in those bombs go? So I took students, some from this class, down, and we dove in this bay. Uh, we found a, uh, an old destroyer. Uh, we found 2,000 pound bombs that were as long as this stage uh, and about that wide, lying underwater, <laughs> rusting out, leaking. We found mounds of artillery shells. Uh, <clears throat> I remember one case where I was, uh, my goggles had fogged up and I came to the surface and like looked around and uh, looked and saw there was a tank on, the, on a hill that was only about 20 meters from where I was. And then I cleared my goggles and I looked down and I was within about uh, two feet standing on a pile of of artillery shells. And I hadn't really put two and two together, uh, but destroyers had sat offshore and for 30, 40 years were lobbing uh, these artillery shells at the tank on the hill for target practice. And a bunch of them had missed uh, and piled up in the same place. So they're still sitting there. I, mean, I could take, uh, take you there now. Uh, we could still see the 2,000 pound bombs. So the, the uh, Base Closure and, and uh, Reclamation Act uh, back uh, that, that was established that's closing down a bunch of these bases has led the Army, the Air Force, the Navy uh, to basically close bases, walk away, and uh, clean up according to standards that they believe are safe. So this will be a story about uh, standard setting that turns into a story about chemicals moving in the, in the marine food chain. You've heard about mercury and tuna. Uh, you, you've probably heard about mercury in, in shark in large predatory fish, but you probably haven't heard about mercury in the array of tropical fish uh, that uh, exist in, in uh, 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 the Caribbean seas. Well, that's because they haven't been studied. People tend to look at, uh, at the chemicals in the larger fish. They tend to avoid uh, the, the study of, of uh, uh, this set of tropical fish uh, because these don't comprise a large proportion of the U.S. average diet. Uh, or other high-income nations that would fund this kind of research uh, uh, would not comprise uh, their, their diet. <clears throat> so the problem I face in Puerto Rico is, wow, you know, uh, I know that these people eat a lot of these fish, um, and there are probably two dozen that they eat on a routine basis. Uh, what happens to uh, TNT, HDX, which are explosives? What happens to cadmium and mercury uh, and, and lead and uh, aluminum and copper and a variety of other chemicals that are components of munitions? Uh, how do they build up and fish, and is this population more exposed than, than others? So that island communities, whether it's the Marshall Islanders, uh, the Seychelles Islanders, <coughs> the uh, uh, the Akenzi, uh that have these diets that are very rich in fish, they can be more exposed than, than others. <coughs> so I'm going to jump ahead here because I'm running out of time, and I'll come back to these um, and get to the final slide. Oh, I see how much fun we're going to have. I want to leave you today with one image. I was up in the Wasatch uh, last week. I spent uh, eight days, uh, eight days in heaven, so to speak. If any of you have not been to the Wasatch, I encourage you to go there. This is just east of, of uh, Salt Lake City, about uh, 10,000 feet in height. And uh, standing there, uh, looking out at these magnificent mountains, uh, I suddenly realized, you know, given what I've told you today, chemical movement through the atmosphere, through the environment, I suddenly realized that the idea of wildness, the idea of purity, uh, the idea of environmental quality uh, that most people have and most people value, uh, it's really being challenged by the way we're using and abusing chemicals. So that uh, the failure of law to effectively control these chemicals uh, 
to rain down in the snows in the Wasatch, to get into the bodies of different species of wildlife, into the plants and the animals, uh, or to, to, to humans that are drinking the water. The failure to control that is challenging our very sense of what wildness is, of what purity is, of what nature is. So I'm going to close there and leave you with uh, a sense of challenge uh, that uh, we need to think about a different system. We need to think about a different way for law to work uh, that could prevent this uh, from continuing through future generations. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you.